Hello, I'm Cleo Franklin. I'm the founder and CEO of Morningside Colleges, Franklin Leadership Foundation, and global consulting business, Franklin Strategic Solutions. I'm also the proud author of a new book just released called Coffee with Cleo. But folks, I'm not here to talk about me. I'm here today to introduce an exciting new partnership with Morningside College. It's called the Franklin Leadership Professional Development Series. This series is really developed with you in mind. As we deal with the challenges of COVID-19 that has brought about a lot of uncertainty, fear and doubt, we feel that with chaos comes opportunity. And this initiative is that opportunity to share with you by introducing and bringing to you virtually the best minds across the globe to talk to you about issues, challenges, topics that you're concerned with. What do I do when it comes to pursuing a career? How do I professionally network? What are the tips and tricks to be successful in my life? I hope that you'll find a series in this platform of engagement with business professionals will be enlightening for you to help you not only rise, but soar to the next level. Thank you so much. And on behalf of Morningside, as well as those involved with the Franklin Leadership Foundation, we welcome this opportunity to engage with you. All the best. But um, Welcome everybody for joining us today. Um, today's session is really exciting because I think out of all the sessions that we're offering, this is the session that's the kind of the most applicable to, to anybody at any point in their life. So today we're gonna be learning about the entrepreneurial mindset in work and in life. Uh, but before we get started, I did want to introduce Cleo Franklin is um, the the mind meld behind this whole program. So I wanted to do a quick introduction of him and then he's gonna introduce Dr. Murphy and then we will get started. So Cleo graduated from Morningside College in 1981 and he currently serves on the Morningside College Board of Directors. He is passionate about providing opportunities and resources to inspire and support the next generation of leaders. He is the founder of the Morningside College Franklin Leadership Foundation author of the leadership book, Coffee with Cleo, and the founder, president, and CEO of Franklin Strategic Solutions, a global consultant and leadership development business specializing in global strategic planning, marketing, business development, organizational development, brand strategy, executive coaching, and keynote speaking for all industries. So with that wonderful introduction, Cleo, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself and, um, and join us. Yes, that's fantastic. Thank you from, so much, Stacy, for the wonderful interview and uh, opportunity to um, bring on one of the, I, I would say, someone that not only is a colleague, but a fellow board member and, and, and someone I firmly believe that truly understands this whole construct that you're going to be introduced today. Uh, Dr. Patrick Murphy uh, is going to discuss the application of the entre entrepreneur's mindset not just your business, but personal life. And this is a model that I apply to within my daily life. And whether you're a student that's interested in starting a business or interested in moving around the fringes of entrepreneurship, I think it's great to have someone that is not just that understands this from an academia perspective, but also in real life. Patrick's experience from basically managing and developing and building startup ecosystems from beginning to end, not just from funding, ideation, to collaboration, to implementation and execution. I think in life, theory is not enough. We must apply. If we have someone to speak to who has applied and still learning about this concept, then there's no better person to dive into it and to discuss it, as I will introduce Dr. Patrick J. Murphy. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Cleo. Thank you, Stacy. Welcome, everybody. I um, I'm very excited to do this because um, it's probably my favorite thing to do. Um, a lot of people take vacations in the summertime. Uh, I don't. I prefer to do this. Um, we're talking about something that I I love, and that is uh, entrepreneurial approaches to problems in society, and um, problems in business problems in the world, problems in communities, problems in markets. Um, problems are gonna be a theme throughout the presentation today. And I think we have about 45 minutes, so I will move through this rather expeditiously. Um, 
but there's probably three themes that I want you to take away after this uh, talk today. Problems is one of them. Um, we tend to get conditioned, I think, in society to move away from problems uh, because they take us out of our comfort zone. We, um, we, we can look to the natural world, uh, which we occupy along with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of other minute and large life forms. And we can look at the ones that choose to stay in their comfort zone, like the amoeba, which is, I think all, probably all of you know what an amoeba is, but it's a unicellular organism. A lot of them live on the ocean floor. They've been there for millions of years and they've never evolved because they always stay in their comfort zone. If the water is too warm or the conditions just aren't quite right, they, they move away from that and they stay right where they're comfortable. Humans are the opposite. Uh, we are intrigued by things that take us out of our comfort zone. And as a result of that, we have been able to grow and evolve and build things. And so when you look for um, things that aren't quite right in the world, that's where entrepreneurship starts. It is a key part of the entrepreneurial mindset. If you are comfortable uh, living with big unquestioned answers and going to sleep at night with big unquestioned answers, I would ask you to train yourself in the discipline of becoming comfortable with big unanswered questions, things that you don't have the answers to right now and therefore they put a little bit of uncertainty in your life. Train yourself to be comfortable with that and to be able to go to sleep at night with that. Be comfortable with big unanswered questions. So questions and problems are the same thing. Problems, as I said earlier, are gonna be a theme of this talk, but um, Questions and problems are really the same thing. In fact, in a lot of languages, the same word is used to describe each one. The Chinese language, for example, Mandarin Chinese. I speak Mandarin Chinese. I was a foreign student there and I've uh, done a lot of work over there, but the, pro the word for problem or question is wen ti. Maybe there's a Chinese speaker watching and they can verify that, but wen ti, the, the meaning of it really depends on the larger context in which it is used, but is literally the same character and the same word. Problems call for solutions, questions call for answers in the same way that demand calls for supply. There's a fundamental essential balance to what we're gonna talk about and we'll get into it a little bit later. But just remember that you need to be intrigued by problems, especially right now um, in these extraordinary circumstances that are going on in our, in our nation, in our society, in the world. Um, there are a lot of problems. And in the entrepreneurial mind, that means there's a lot of opportunities. It doesn't mean that they're sitting right in front of you and you can pick them up and do something with them. It means you have to innovate in relation to them. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But problems, questions, I hope in that short bit that I just went through right there expeditiously, I've gotten you thinking a little bit differently about problems. They're not something to be put to despair by or put up tight about or to be afraid of. You should rush toward them and engage them because you need problems in order to get opportunities. And you need opportunities if you're gonna do something entrepreneurial. I'm gonna get into some uh, frameworks I'm gonna show you here in a moment, but there's one other thing that I want to uh, say to you about another theme um, that is going to define our time together, and that is growth. Um, it, it's different from problems and all that that I was talking about. Growth is definitive to entrepreneurial action. Um, if you're not trying to grow something, you're, you're not going to be doing entrepreneurial things. You may own a business, you may operate a business, you may manage a business, but if you're not trying to grow that business or that project or that venture, um, you're not undertaking entrepreneurship, which means you're not going to be doing a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about today. It, it still means you're a business owner. It still means that you're, you're an entrepreneur in the sense that you created a business. And that, that's great, that's wonderful. There's no value judgment about this, but what you actually do is management. You're, you're making decisions about resources in terms of time, money, talent, people, technology, physical space, all these different things you can assemble and manage and plan, organize, lead, and control. And that's described by the domain of management. It's different from the domain of entrepreneurship because of growth. And this is important. I mean, I'm not just talking about a simple thing. I know you've all heard the word before, but we really fundamentally are very bad 
at managing growth. And I need everybody that's listening to me right now to understand that. We are terrible at managing growth, probably because the way the educational system works and the way we look for stability, we're, we're even in statistics and when we work with data, we're, we're conditioned to think in terms of Gaussian distributions, the, the normal curve, the bell-shaped distribution, which you're all familiar with, the bell curve, it's often called. Um, that's really, you know, it's been called by some a great intellectual fraud. It's not really the way nature works. Um, nature works out on the margins, out on the tails of that distribution. But that, that paradigm of um, this bell-shaped distribution will have you looking for the average, the most common thing that's going on. It's very much related to our comfort zone. It's very much related to doing things that other people are doing and being average. Well, again, that, that's, there's no value judgment here. That's fine if you, if you like that, the, the comfort of being average, but the entrepreneurial mindset deplores it. It is not interested in being average. If you're going to be average as an entrepreneur, you're going to fail. What an entrepreneur does goes way out to the tail ends of the distribution, where in statistics we call them outliers. Uh, we treat them as error, something that is wrong, not normal, different. We are much more intrigued by that. And then we, we, we be unlike everybody else. If everybody else is doing it, we're not interested. We know where the wide road leads. We don't want to go there. We go out to the tail ends of the distribution and do something different from what everybody else is doing. And then if you do it well, then the curve moves over toward you. And as it does, your venture grows and you, you, you can profit from that. You can make impact from that. So growth occurs in that sort of situational logic. It does not exist in the middle of normal distributions. And I said we were poor at managing growth. So I'll do a little thought experiment before I get into my framework that I want to talk about. Um, say you have a piece of paper in front of you. Maybe you do right now. I don't know. But if you look at that paper, it's, um, it's pretty thin. It's actually about half a millimeter thin, not very thick at all. And if you fold it over once, it becomes a millimeter thick. Fold it again, it's two millimeters thick. And then four, eight, 16 millimeters thick and so forth. So the question is, you know, I just talked about doubling it four times five times, six times. The question is how many times would we need to double that thin piece of paper in that way before it would be thick enough to reach from here to the moon? Now, physically you can't fold a piece of paper that many times. So it's like an imaginary sort of thought experiment here, but we're talking about doubling the thin piece of paper. Um, I do this a lot. I've taught this material around the world and there's always a bunch of wild guesses about it. Many times somebody, nowadays at least, they'll Google it on their phone and find out what the answer is really quickly. But um, most people don't know. And they'll say things like a million or 100,000 or 500 million and they'll throw out all these numbers which are way off, which again is proving my point. We're, we're poor at understanding growth, especially ex exponential growth. And the guesses are all over the board, um, which also proves my point. Um, we're very bad at conceptualizing growth because of the way we're taught to think about the world. The, the answer is it's about 44 or something like that, 44 times, period. And if that's surprising to you, that, that also proves my point. We're bad at managing growth. But you need to understand that if you, if you launch an entrepreneurial project, there are many empirical elements around that activity that will grow on that order of magnitude in terms of the exposure that your business gets or the attention that is paid to it by the community or the market or, or the money that you make or the person hours that are involved in the productivity and the operations, all the various empirical elements that we can measure and think about as we, need, as we make entrepreneurial decisions about how to lead the business will be subject to that sort of growth. And as I say, human beings are very bad at thinking about growth. So growth is another very important theme of the entrepreneurial mindset. It exists in the realm of uncertainty because anything that grows will evolve or adapt. And it's gonna do that in relation to the environment. And we don't know what the environment's gonna do, so we don't know exactly how we're going to adapt. The other aspect of growth is that it generates waste and error. 
I'm going to bring up a model right here. I hope you all can see it um, before I get into some of this other stuff. I should be behind the model and you should be able to see this thing in front of me. I'm not going to, I didn't even plan on showing this to you. This is something I've used for a long time to teach entrepreneurship. But when we, um, when we discover uh, an opportunity, you can see it. It looks great. Okay, good. Um, that's where we start, right down here where my finger is pointing to. Um, these are things that exist inside your head. You may see a problem in the world. You may see an opportunity uh, emerge from it, and then you may come up with an idea in relation to that opportunity, and then you may start to assemble resources around it, and then it may even gain traction and start to grow and make impact. At every stage of that very general process, error can occur. And that's reflected in the dotted lines that go down to the bottom. And then there's that rectangle at the bottom of the model. Anything that grows generates waste. That's true in the natural world that we were talking about earlier. It's also true in the entrepreneurial realm. So you should not be afraid of making mistakes. If you're leading an organization and you want your people to do entrepreneurial things, you need to be ready for a lot of mistakes to be made. And it's not enough just to say, oh, it's okay to make mistakes. You need to recognize them for what they are. They are in the biological world or the natural world, they are fertilizer. They're, they help everything else grow. They're part of the ecosystem. They also are in the entrepreneurial realm. Many of our most popular, well-known entrepreneurial innovations and inventions and ideas are the product of mistakes. In fact, I was just reading about one the other day. I forgot what the hell it was. I can't remember. But I, I do remember a very famous one. The post-it note was also born of an error, an unexpected turn, an unexpected outcome that was not part of the plan when you took action. And therefore, it was out on the tail end of the curve. So error and waste, are they're actually a discovery engine in the entrepreneurial world as long as you put boundaries around the costs that are associated with them. And that just means don't, don't bet the farm, don't mortgage your house on a new idea unless you're damn sure about what's going to happen. It's better to take small baby steps, smaller steps, start your venture as a project and grow it. It's what we call the lean startup approach or paradigm. Therefore, you can afford to lose. You can afford to make a mistake. And then what you find is that you may make nine errors, you may make nine mistakes, but you will succeed about one out of 10 times when you're trying new and innovative things. And the positive value generated from the one hit will outweigh the negative value generated by the nine failures. And on balance, we move forward, we evolve, and we grow. All right, that was my um, introduction to some important principles that are gonna be, in, I think it'll help you if you keep them in mind as I talk about this model right here. This model right here, it took me about 17 minutes to get to it. And now I'm, I'm gonna spend probably maybe 30 minutes on this with you, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, remember those things, questions, growth, error, as we talk through some of the more practical elements in this model right here. Let me just tee this up for you a little bit. I'll take a drink of my coffee. As you look at it, um, you'll notice that there are two dimensions, vertical one and a horizontal one. They're not correlated with one another. That means they're, we call that orthogonal. They're not correlated, it's a 90 degree angle between them. They're qualitatively different. Um, uh, one of them is defined by passion up at the top, pragmatism at the bottom. Passion means you're excited about what you're doing. It's personally meaningful to you and so doing that activity energizes you. It doesn't deplete you of energy. It energizes you and you love to do it. This is why entrepreneurs work probably twice as much as their corporate counterparts, even though on average they make about half as much. They work about twice as much, but they're also twice as happy because when you're doing something you love, you enjoy it and it's inspired behavior, passion. The polar opposite of that down at the bottom is pragmatic. That just means practical, pragmatism making decisions that um, everybody can recognize are good, workable, feasible decisions. It's not enough just to be a passionate artist. You'll go out there and you'll, you'll become a martyr or you'll become destitute. You need to temper all of that energy with a pragmatic approach. And that's why these are polar opposites. Entrepreneurs need to be both um, in the beginning. And then as the venture grows, they need to bring in 
elements of both both kinds of energies into their venture. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but it's very hard for one person to do both of those at the same time and do both of them well. Usually, if your venture gains traction, you're either going to become the artist or the business person, um, one or the other. You, you can't be both and be excellent at both because the mode of thinking is literally um, diametrically opposed in terms of its logic. This is why music bands have managers. This is why artists have managers. It's very important to have that dichotomy there. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, but that's reflected in that vertical dimension. It's a very important part of the entrepreneurial mindset as you use the entrepreneurial mindset to approach work and life. The uh, horizontal dimension is on the right personal. When you, when you see a problem in the world, typically it is something that you observe or recognize as a lone individual person. You see it and you're able to see it. If you really drill down to the reasoning behind this, you're able to see it because of who you are. Um, who you are and what your mindset is and how you view the world and what language you speak and what, what culture you have will make certain things invisible to you and certain other things visible to you. It's actually a very personal enterprise. It's a very personal experience when you see a problem in the world because your values are activated. Everybody has different sets of values around their culture, heritage, religion, their, their personal traits and, and so forth. So being personal is important to entrepreneurship. It, it, it all starts from there. And I think it has to start from there. And the challenge is to, is to try to keep it personal because if you, if you maintain a personal aspect to what you do, you're able to become excellent. If you lose that, you, you become good, you know, you become average, you become just like everybody else, but it's an important part of entrepreneurial action. However, it's not enough. It's necessary, but not sufficient to do high impact entrepreneurial things. The polar opposite of personal is public. And by public, that just means it's not enough just to sit in your room and think about things all day long. Eventually you have to go out and tell people about what you're thinking and then influence them. That relates to what I said earlier about when you're out on the tail end of the distribution, the curve moves toward you. It's not going to do that if you don't know you're there, if, if they don't know you're there. You have to let the world know that you're doing something that's unique and different, personally inspired, and then bring them over to you. And that is necessarily public. So again, we have two conceptual opposites on this horizontal dimension, and both are related to entrepreneurship. So the entrepreneur, over the course of their entrepreneurial journey, needs to do both. All right? So those are the two dimensions. And whenever you have two dimensions, each having two levels, it generates four quadrants if you set them up this way. Two dimensions with two levels equals four quadrants. Um, you can see top right, quadrant number one, personal, passionate. Quadrant two over here to the um, left, down here, and so forth. So we have four quadrants which involve um, like factorial permutations, if you will, of the two dimensions that I just talked through. Now, within each of those quadrants, this is the journey we're going to take. I'll zoom in on the first one, and then we'll kind of move around the model as a way to uh, explore this conceptual domain. And as I do it, I want you to think about the things in your life right now or the things in your future that you've maybe thought about doing that might be entrepreneurial and how these things apply. This first quadrant right here shows us where we start. This is where one starts if one wants to do an entrepreneurial thing. The start is personal because, as I said earlier, you observe a problem in the world that you want to do something about. All entrepreneurship starts with problems. I'll repeat that. All entrepreneurship starts with problems. You don't go where everything's great if you want to be an entrepreneur. Some of the, uh, the highest rates of venture formation in our nation's history have been during bad times, economic downturns. downturns. Uber started during an economic downturn. More ventures started during the Great Depression in terms of uh, per capita than any other historic period in our nation's history. Whenever there's a disaster, economic, natural, or otherwise, um, entrepreneurial energy tends to follow it. The flagship uh, co-working space in the city of Chicago is called 1871. 
I used to work out of there when I lived there. 1871 is the year of the Great Chicago Fire. It's named after a great disaster because of the entrepreneurial action that followed it. And so these are very personal decisions to become an entrepreneur, and they're usually motivated by a passion that you have that's related to your values. Your values are very important. You guys all need to take time to um, just have free unstructured time and think about your values and what you stand for. They can come from your culture, your religion, but your values have the character of expectations about the future. They are a superpower. They are the way that we engage uncertainty because they give us a roadmap for where to go. You, when we really want to know what we're going to do in an uncertain environment, we typically look to our values and what the, those things that we believe in that are immutable and unimpeachable, and they're very important. So you spend time in the beginning thinking about those things, and that's how you do what I say, what, what I call um, cultivating a personal style. You, you have to have a good sense of what you are, what you're made of, what you believe in strongly, what you're not willing to compromise on. And as I say, those can come from a lot of things, your family, your culture, your religion, your education, whatever it is that makes you, you. That's key. Because if you start assembling resources around an entrepreneurial venture, you're going to make decisions that reflect who you are. And as you make those decisions, you create what we call embedding mechanisms that are the seeds of the culture of that future organization. It will be reflective of who you are and how you make decisions. And everybody needs to feel that who eventually joins your venture because it will, as I say, give them a roadmap for engaging uncertainty. There's a couple of other things that tend to happen in the beginning besides cultivating your personal style, studying concepts and building skills. We're, we're kind of studying the concepts right now, right? I mean, I'm giving you frameworks to think about and I'm giving you uh, rational um, principles to think about as you um, imagine a future or think about the world, but studying concepts is something that's done in the beginning. So I, I work with a lot of entrepreneurship learners. I, I've done it in the Middle East and Saudi Arabia. I've done it all across China. I've done it in three, four, four different European countries. Um, I, I've done it in New Zealand. I've done it in America, in Chicago. Now I'm in Alabama, sweet home Alabama. And in all of those places, Folks study concepts. Concepts are essential, global, timeless. Um, a good theory has these qualities, but we need to think global but act local. It's very important to tailor the concepts that you learn to your local community, market, or whatever the local situation is that you're in. So think globally, act locally. We'll talk about action here in just a little bit. And then the third one before I move on to the next quadrant is uh, build skills. Skills are a little bit different from concepts. They need to be updated every once in a while. So if you're going to work in a different culture, like different national culture, where maybe a different language is used to convey meaning, learning that language is a skill, right? Language is the carrier of culture. It can be very important depending on where you go. Not even, gosh, we're not even talking about like different languages. In the world, we're talking about different ways of speaking in our own country. I mean, gosh, we speak differently in Alabama. That I can tell you. You can probably tell by the way that I articulate my own words that I'm not from here, but I'm learning. And I've learned how to use y'all. Y'all is a great word. It's gender neutral. It can be used in so many different ways. We have another phrase we say down here, bless your heart, which has a bunch of different meanings. We didn't say bless your heart in Chicago. We used a different kind of phrase to convey that kind of meaning in the city of Chicago. But there's just different ways of conveying meaning. I even remember when I was at Morningside in the 90s. I'm, I'm from Washington State. I'm not from Iowa. But folks would say, is he there yet? And to me, that meant he hasn't arrived, but we're waiting for him. But they would use yet to mean, is he still there? Right. I, some of you are from Iowa, so you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Like little things like that are associated with language, not just spoken language, but programming languages, coding. Those are skills. Learning how to use software is a skill. These are things that you, you brush up on and you learn. They're tools that you need to learn and maintain and renew every once in a while. So these are the things that happen in the beginning. They tend to be personal pursuits. That's why we have personal down here, I'm trying to point at it. And then we have passion over here. It's usually motivated behavior, passionate behavior that enables us to do that. So that's where it starts, folks. Um, I'm going to move on to the second quadrant. Um, 
eventually your motivated, passionate behavior needs to be transformed into a public facing kind of enterprise. When you tell other people what you're doing, you go out and you research the environment. And there's a couple of other types of things that one does here that are um, less personal and more public. Exploring the environment is one of them. I've worked with thousands of entrepreneurs and researching and exploring the environment is something they always do. I'll have students at university and then they'll have access to all these wonderful databases in the library and then they'll graduate and they'll lose that access and then they'll become an entrepreneur and then they'll come back to me and they'll say something like, hey, can I get into that Dun & Bradstreet database or those census data or whatever? I really need to look at how many businesses in this particular industry exist in these five zip codes or wh whatever research question that they have, they're exploring the environment. And as you can see in the example, they need to come to others. They need to come to me. They need to come to the library. They need to do that because they tell us why they're looking for these data and they're, they're exploring and they're learning. It's motivated behavior, but it, it's turning toward the public world around them because they have to engage other people to do that. That's something that happens typically after you do the things I talked about in the first quadrant. Another thing is uh, the engagement of mentors. Very important. Mentors are vital. Um, there's a lot of different theories about what makes a good mentor. I'll just tell you mine. It should be somebody who has deep, relevant experience in what you want to do, but they should not be a competitor. They should not be someone who's going to uh, hate on you if you succeed or not someone who's going to want to get in on the action if your project starts taking off. That can happen. You don't want that. You want somebody who's already arrived, someone who's already made it, someone who's going to be happy to see you succeed. Professors who are really doing it for the right reasons are great mentors. Um, many times older relatives are great mentors, so on and so forth. Uh, I think you get what I'm saying. The third one I want to take a moment to talk about, it's um, this is a very important, gosh, it's probably the most important part of entrepreneurial action. The key words here are opportunity and idea. You discover an opportunity based on a problem. We've already talked a little bit about that. But then you formulate an idea in relation to the opportunity. And the difference between ideas and opportunities is vital. It's so important. In fact, I'm going to move over to this other model, which I didn't plan to show you, but this is called the heptological model. It's in one of my publications. We use it to teach entrepreneurship here in my entrepreneurship program. It's used at my previous university and it's used at a couple other universities in our country. It's also used in a couple European universities. It's used in Macau. It is a, a model for thinking about entrepreneurship that you can use for teaching. You can see that the idea and the opportunity are right here in this rectangle as two separate elements. I'm not gonna get into this model. I can teach a semester long class based on this thing, but suffice it to say that as you can see, opportunities come from problems, but these two things are fundamentally opposite. They relate to many different things in, entrepreneur in entrepreneurial contexts. For example, um, opportunities are external, ideas are internal. That means opportunities are related to everything external to the venture. The market, for example, is external to the venture. What's the opposite of a market in an entrepreneurial setting? The product. We talk in terms of product market fit or service market fit and how they relate to one another. The product and the service come from the idea. The market and the community are external. There are many, many things that relate to this. We, we have technology that's internal. We have um, external appetites for that technology. We have um, internal ideas, we have external action, we have the artist, which I talked about earlier, we have the business person, we have product, we have market, we even have costs, which are endogenously internally generated, and we have revenues, which are externally exogenously generated. Um, very, very important to mention. It is truly the number one reason entrepreneurial ventures fail. And that is a failure to delineate effectively between opportunities and ideas. I mean, just to give you an example of how naughty this can be. By naughty, I mean K-N-O-T-T-Y. Naughty, not naughty like a, like a bad kid or something like that. Naughty. Um, if you're running an entrepreneurial venture that has financial problems, it can be really hard to tease these apart. You don't know really, truly, if your financial problems come from 
you don't always know if they come from revenues being too low or costs being too high. You, you can't prove it either way. You can't prove revenues have been maximized. You can't prove costs have been minimized. It, I mean, just to make it really concrete, if, if you want to buy a car and you can't afford that car, why can't you afford it? Well, you can say the car is too expensive. That's an external argument. Or you can say you don't have enough money. That's an internal argument. And you can push it both ways. And in the evolved context of an operating venture, you can't tease them apart. So you need to tease them apart in the beginning. All right. So that's that part right there. Very important. And it's something that one needs to think about early in the life cycle of the venture. All right. I'm going to use the last 10 minutes to talk through these bottom two quadrants. After you go out and tell people about what you want to do and do research and talk to your mentors about, you know, with, with, with passion and excitement about what you want to do, eventually you need to temper that passion. You need to circumscribe it because it will, it will lead you astray if left unchecked. Um, you don't need to get rid of it. You just want to put boundaries around it. it, it it's a force of nature. Uh, your human, a force of human nature. Your passion is like that. Kind of like errors and mistakes are bound to happen in entrepreneurial action. They're, they're a force of nature too, but we can profit from them if we put effective boundaries around them and use them effectively. If we make a mistake, you don't want to throw it away. When you have impassioned behaviors, you don't want to try to eliminate those. You just want to be able to separate what's valuable in that from what's not valuable. And as you do that, you move toward a more practical approach to being an entrepreneur. Um, it's hard, like I said earlier, for any one person to be an artist and a business person at the same time. Um, there are very strong uh, team building ramifications around this conundrum. If you're the artist, you, you should probably hire an accountant or a good business head to help you, um, help complement you. Or if you're a very pragmatic sort of individual, you might need to inject some bottom-up force of nature um, approaches, entrepreneurial, strong, passionate entrepreneurial approaches to the operation, and then you may look for someone who's different from you. There's a very complementary relationship there. As you move toward being more pragmatic, oftentimes it means you hire somebody who's more pragmatic. That's why we have form team right here. It's necessarily public behavior because you have to go out and if you don't post the job, you're talking to people, you're warming up your network, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But it's very public activity, but everybody, listen, it's also very pragmatic activity. You should not go with your gut when you're bringing on a co-founder because you feel like they would work well with you. That, that might help, but it's not enough. In fact, in the entrepreneurial domain, it, we tend to find environments populated by folks who are very good at managing impressions. So they'll make you think that they're the best thing for you, but you can, you don't want to do that. You have to do more. You have to undertake a lot of pragmatic activity, meaning researching their background, looking at where they worked before, comparing them to other applicants, looking at their degrees and their skills and what they come from and what their experiences are and looking at references and collecting data. That's all very pragmatic activity. It's not passionate stuff you do for fun. It's pragmatic stuff that you do in order to make an educated, um, practical, good decision. And that's how you build your team. That's how you need to build your team. And you also contract it out. I don't care if it's your brother or your dad. Don't just go into business with folks without putting down on paper who's responsible for what and when you need to come back and renew and look at the contract or look at the agreement again. Um, also, I mean, think about it. I, I mean, I know a venture in Chicago. I'm not going to mention the name because we're recording this, but the father and son founded it. It's in the restaurant industry. They didn't talk to each other for 12 years because they had a fight over money. And if you have a disagreement, which, you know, we're bad at handling growth, like I talked about. So if you're going to grow, you might come time to hire somebody or do something. And if you have different ideas about what to do, the fact that you're kin makes it harder to work out the disagreement because it's so personal and it just becomes a mess. So have a contract in which you can articulate the conditions under which you 
will not be responsible for particular things, even if it's your dad or your mom. I know that may feel weird to a lot of people. We can do it, though, more easily in this country, in my experience, and in a lot of other countries. And in a lot of other countries, contracts are actually a little bit culturally, um, you run into weird barriers around them, but we won't get into that. The other part is navigating a network. Really briefly, we have about six minutes here before I wrap this up. So navigating a network. This is so important to entrepreneurs you have to navigate your network you don't just network you don't just go out and talk to people you gotta be like a navigator on the ocean it's an ocean of people out there man it's not even an ocean of people it's an it's a universe of talent people don't just show up as warm bodies when you're an entrepreneur they show up as bringing certain skills and competencies close to you that you may be able to use where they have other kinds of resources that you can use and bootstrap. You can use resources you don't own in order to work on your business, like a, like a free garage space on weekends to assemble your product, or you do a deal with a restaurateur that you know, and um, if you fix their, their plumbing, they'll let you eat free there for a month or something like that. You know, Networking involves these kinds of bootstrapping types of things, but we have to understand that the network is very complex. Just like um, charting the ocean, it has levels and it has different areas. And you don't just go by your seat of your pants. You actually have to scope it out and think about it. So a couple of different, there, it's kind of fun to think about this stuff. You, you think about a networking event, right? You go there, there's 100 people in the room. You're looking for like a particular type of talent or a particular type of person. Guess what? It is unlikely that that one individual you're looking for is going to be in that room. I don't care if there's 200 people there, unlikely. So what do you do? You talk to all those people anyway, and you make yourself memorable to them. And the way you make yourself memorable to them is by being just explicit, telling them about what you're doing. I'm building a business that does this. It's unique from everybody else because of that. You can share with them a little bit about what makes you uniquely um, unique in all of this world and what you do, make an impression, okay? That, that's the point. Because what's gonna happen is when that networking event ends and the 200 people plus you go home, that person, one of the people you talk to next week is gonna be at another networking event with another 200 people who weren't at the first event and you're not at the second event either. And they're talking to somebody else and that other person who you've never met in your life or even heard of says something to them that triggers a memory of you. And they're not gonna remember you if you weren't memorable, but they, that person says something that's complimentary. And then that, that node between the two of you says to that person, man, there is someone you should meet. And then you get an unexpected introduction through LinkedIn or an email you know, weeks later. You can't predict when these things are gonna happen. That's, that's kind of how you navigate a network. You can also navigate these events. It's kind of fun actually to go to these big events full of people because you'll look at like, a group of people over here, a single individual over there. Your strategy and your tactics need to be very different for how you approach those two different elements. With one person, they're easy to engage, but hard to disengage from. With a group, they're hard to engage, but easy to disengage from. They're opposite. So with an individual, you might go up to them and talk to them, but you can't just sit there all night talking to that one person. And then eventually you have to say, uh, nice meeting you. I'm going to go away from you now and go talk to other people. A little bit awkward, right? But you know, you just have to learn how to do that. And then with the group of people, it's, you know, they may be talking, it's hard to butt in and, you know, hey guys, blah, blah, blah. blah. You kind of have to be interruptive and so forth, but then they're easy to disengage because you can just duck out. And that's all pragmatic activity. By pragmatic, I mean, you can strategize this. You can put it on paper and list it, make a list of everyone you meet, and you need to do that when you know. Um, okay, last quadrant, and then we'll wrap it up. Things become personal again, guys. Um, anything that grows, as we talked about earlier, growth is very important. Anything that grows will eventually die, including us, including your venture. It's either going to die or it's going to reincarnate to live on in another form, right? Like, you know, the March of Dimes kind of did that. They were set up to fight polio, and then a cure for polio came out, and they completely reinvented themselves. A lot of ventures do things like that. But as you, as you move along in your entrepreneurial journey, you will need to confront change in the environment. Change happens over long and short stretches of time. 
It happens over short stretches of time with your customers and your competitors and things like that. But it happens over long stretches of time when it comes to things like the sociocultural environment or technological applications or uh, the natural world or the economic environment. These things change a little bit more slowly and it's important to be aware of them as they change. And eventually you can bet on it. Something will happen in the environment that will you'll need to confront it because it will go against what you really started out to do. And you'll need either need to avoid it or pivot around it or, you know, just make sure it doesn't mean the death of your business. And you need to confront that. That has a way, ladies and gentlemen, of making things personal again. Those are very personal decisions. You have to maybe sell your business or hand over the reins to somebody else. And you you start thinking about why you started to begin with. You start thinking about why you why you even got into this entrepreneurial gig. You start thinking about why you started engaging that initial problem to begin with and whether or not you need to exit or not. Very personal decision. I, um, I, I always think of the guy, his nickname was Kinko in college. He founded Kinko's. He was making copies for his uh, uh, classmates and so forth. Anyway, he sold to FedEx, which I think all of you know, and I, I met him in Chicago years ago. And he was like literally just angry, like looking at what FedEx was doing with his business. It was very personal to him because that's how entrepreneurship starts. And I'll just end with that. Um, the other element that one needs to think about in the entrepreneurial mindset is an exit strategy. An exit strategy, meaning at the time you enter into that journey, know the conditions under which you will exit that journey. People who uh, invest, people who are financial analysts and traders and so forth, they know this. The people who do best in that realm are the ones who can articulate the conditions they'll exit a position at the moment they take a position through a limit order or something like that. But that's very important in entrepreneurship because we're talking about growth. So I'll end there. We're at 1246 by my clock. It's been an honor to talk with you. I can't see any of you. I have no idea who's out there. So I'd be happy to take any questions or just. Um, talk about anything you'd like me to talk about, but thanks Stacy and Cleo. It was a lot of fun to share this info. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'll stop there and um, I'm at your service. Absolutely. So thank you, Patrick, very much. That was very informative and, and um, love the charts and the quadrants and everything. If you are on line right now and you have a question, we're going to encourage you to go ahead and put that in the chat and then we can make sure that we will monitor these questions. So we do have a question right away, it looks like. Um, would you have any comments on entrepreneurial exhaustion? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, self-care, wellness, and so forth. It, we have a lot of conversations about that in the entrepreneurial realm. I, I actually know some entrepreneurs that are doing things to support entrepreneurs because it can exhaust you. It, it's like, you know, even if you love what you're doing, you, you have physical limits, right? And mental limits. So you need to be aware of that. I have a couple of um, um, observations about this topic. One of them is, I, I think I alluded to it earlier. Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I just thought of it. But make unstructured time for yourself. Um, you know, I'm not an entrepreneur. I, I'm a full-time academic. But um, if I was not an academic, ladies and gentlemen, I assure you I would be an entrepreneur. I cannot work. No way could I work in a large corporate or organizational setting. My wife can. She's very good at it. She's actually, I can hear her upstairs. She's on Zoom calls and she her whole day is planned. I can't do it. It would exhaust me. Um, what I do is I have a policy. I generally do not have meetings before noon. Um, I, that is my unstructured time. I, I read books. I read a lot of history books. I, I, I drove to get coffee earlier at a nearby village by where we live. Um, that unstructured time, whether you're running, whether you're, you know, just build that into your life, you know, it, and it's hard as an entrepreneur. This is not like mom and pop advice because entrepreneurs, you know, you want to, you always pick up the phone whenever someone just carve out that time where you can have some me time where you can think and just do something completely unrelated to work. That, that's one thing. Uh, another element is uh, related to something that we talked about 
we just did a long project. We wrapped up a long project last week with a company called Baby Palooza here in Birmingham. In fact, it's on YouTube. Our final presentation is if you want to look it up and see, they're a phenomenal entrepreneurial venture. Uh, they, and you know, we had talked a lot about this exhaustion topic when we worked with her. The entrepreneur started in 2005. I mean, she's already made it, to be honest. She's at a really nice plateau. She probably only needs to work about six months out of the year, but she wants to do more. She wants to go national and international. And one of our strong pieces of advice to her is you need to build capacity by bringing on people onto your leadership team because you're trying to do everything and it's exhausting you. She can't do it or she can do it. It's hard for her to do it like it is for any entrepreneur, though, because it's your baby. You, you, you love that venture and you don't want to give it up and give it to somebody else to hold for a while. But that's part of the entrepreneurial mindset. You need to delegate and give to others and let them take up some of the slack to give you free time to take care of yourself personally. Awesome. Thank you so much. So if, if there are any other questions, go ahead and put those in the chat. Right now, I am just going to go ahead and share the um, share the PowerPoint so that we can look at the um, whoops. There's a question here. OK. Let me... Love the theoretical frameworks. If a student or someone on this call wants to start their own business, what is the tangible first step you would recommend? Uh, find a problem like we talked about. Find a problem. I don't even ask like students or learners, what do you want to be when you grow up or what do you want to do? What do you want? I don't even ask that question anymore. I ask them, what problems are you focused on right now? What problems in the world intrigue you? Um, so Alex, the first tangible step is find a problem, preferably one that everybody knows about, and then come up with a solution to it that only you know about. That's the golden ratio. Find a big, worthy problem and then start studying concepts, building skills and thinking about things around that problem and come up with a solution in relation to it. Eventually, the problem will turn into an opportunity and the, the potential solution will evolve into an idea. And then you have an idea and an opportunity. And that is really the core of entrepreneurial action.